Cat's Cradle here. Sometimes when you garden, your time is not your own. When I got up this morning, uh, I really had not intended to get involved in a canning project. But last night I made the mistake of Googling how to know when to harvest your rhubarb. And everything I read said that really all of your rhubarb should be harvested by mid-June. That is to allow the plant to um, to get enough energy to live through the winter, so that you know your heart it's hardy enough. You haven't just um, depleted its energy, you know, through through the late summer, and then it doesn't have enough strength to survive the winter. So I figured I better get busy, and I really didn't think I had. Uh, too much rhubarb to harvest out there. I've already made rhubarb jam once. But when I went out and got to looking, it said uh, stems that are 10 to 12 inches. Well, I've got some that are, you know, that are much longer than that. My rhubarb is the green variety. It's only red just down at the tip where it, where it joins the rhubarb plant. <clears throat> last year was the first year I planted rhubarb, and I didn't harvest any last year. Uh, you're not supposed to the first year. But this year, it's just gone crazy. And last year, it really looked kind of pathetic, and I really didn't realize that I'd had the green, the green variety. So I thought something was wrong because it wasn't turning red. But this year, I did more research uh, and began to harvest. And I didn't even know I liked rhubarb. I'd never tried it until this year when I made the rhubarb jam. And we love it. It is nice and tart. Uh, if you don't cook it too much, it just makes a lovely jam. Well, it's getting really hot here. And our strawberries have gotten smaller, but I harvested, this is probably about three pounds of strawberries I harvested last night. I thought I had them all. They grow very close to the rhubarb. When I was out picking the rhubarb today and pulled some of the leaves off of the rhubarb, I saw some strawberries growing, growing under them. So I harvested uh, this, many, this many more this morning. A couple of them uh, are, are not quite fully ripened, but that's not going to really matter. Um, uh, when I add the the sugar for the jam. Some of our strawberries, I've never seen anything like it. Some of them are almost are almost black. They're so dark and when you cut into them, they're the darkest, deepest red you've ever seen and they are delicious. So anyway, I think I've I think I've probably got oh three to four pounds of strawberries here. <laughs> Much more rhubarb and that's okay with me. I I, I kinda like that ratio. I'll cut up all this rhubarb. Now, one of the things I learned as, because I'm such a novice to this, is that you don't cut rhubarb. I made that mistake the first time I did it. But as I've studied, you pull it. See, here's where it was pulled, pulled from the mother plant. You just pull it and, it, and it does break off very, very easily. This rhubarb does not have to be peeled. It's very tender. Uh, sometimes you can get a variety that has to be peeled. This one doesn't. Uh, it has a very, very thin uh, outer layer on it, and that just uh, melts, if you will, as you begin to cook it. So it's very, very easy to repair. You cut it up uh, just like it looks like celery. You cut it up just like celery. Some of my, the top of my leaves has kind of been beat up. We had a hail storm a few weeks ago, and it kind of tore some of the leaves up. But uh, the, leaves, the leaves are beautiful. You don't use those. You just cut them off and throw them away, and you just use the stem. Um, both the strawberries and the rhubarb are an effort on our part to not have to replant everything we're consuming every year. The rhubarb comes back on its own. The strawberries, if tended, come back on their own. If you want to know how to save strawberry root, Ironhead 41 has an excellent video on that. Pardon me. <coughs> he has an excellent video on how to save that. You can just dig up the very best ones and store them in a paper bag until spring and then and then plant them again. I like the idea of not having to count on seed every year. We've planted raspberries and blackberries, rhubarb, strawberries, asparagus, fruit trees, those things that will allow us to harvest great food with not quite so much effort as having to go out and till the ground and plant the seed. Now we do a lot of that, but uh, I like having that food that just spontaneously springs forth from the earth on its own. It's a wonderful blessing to us. 
Okay, I'll take you along on this venture. Uh, I'll try not to make it too long. Uh, I'll post the re a recipe for strawberry rhubarb jam down below, and we'll see how this goes. Well, there's nothing easier than preparing the rhubarb to be cut up. Because the plant grows, it doesn't grow like broccoli. You know, broccoli goes really tight together. This this plant grows with the leaves, uh, the stalks really spread out, you know, like this. So uh, every time it rains, it washes down the stalk. They're really clean except for down at the bottom where it, where it joins uh, the base of the plant. And that's where the dirt is. But really the rest of it just has to be rinsed off. It's very, very easy to clean. I thought of another thing I need to tell you. In the spring, when my rhubarb first came, came out, when it first started sprouting, and the the leaves start at the base, they're very, very crinkled, it's just breaking forth out of the ground, and then they come up and start making the stalks. But in the center of both of my plants, there were several of these big round stalks, perfectly round. They're not, they're not shaped like, uh, like the rest of the rhubarb plants that have kind of a, a, an indentation on one side. And it sent up a blossom up here, and the best way to describe it, it's, it's kind of pine cone shape, uh, real tight tightly packed blossoms and I went online to find out what that was and what I should do about it and it said you should get rid of the blossom and cut it off so that the so that the rhubarb doesn't flower and well I cut it off and then I read a little more and it said really you should pull that whole stalk out I'll show you uh, this is really hollow and you, you can hear it's very woody and hard See how that is? That's hollow. And what you don't want to do is cut off the blossom so that the rain goes down there and rots the center of your plant. So I did the wrong thing. Luckily, my plant, my plant is okay. But I should not have cut the blossom off. I should simply have pulled this whole stalk out. So that's just a tip for you if you're new to growing rhubarb like I am. Here's what I ended up with. This big bowl of rhubarb that's all diced up. I know it looks like celery, but it's rhubarb. Kind of got a Christmas theme going here with the red and green. And uh, this many fresh strawberries out of our garden. Uh, I think it's probably about three pounds of each. And I will adjust my recipe accordingly. I will put down uh, below the video for you the recipe the exact recipe you should you should be using and you can adjust it up or down. There are some cautions though uh, when using pectin because pectin sets up very quickly and you need to heat it very quickly once you put it into your boiling fruit. It only needs to cook for a minute. You need to be careful because if you decide to do a larger batch of jelly or jam it takes longer to heat that pectin and the gelling ability of it is diminished the longer the longer it's in the pot, the longer it's on the heat. So, you know, do do more at your own peril. You know, make a bigger batch at your own peril. Uh, the thing you can do also is just maybe just add a little more, a little more of the pectin gel and get it to set up. And I'll and I'll show you how to test that. So now I went and found uh, <laughs> under my daughter's bed. I had a uh, a partial case of half pint half pint jars. You can use pint jars, you can use quart jars, you can do whatever you want. Uh, I like to kind of rotate what we have in our refrigerator to put on our toast. So I like these little half pint jars because by the time I eat a, a half pint of rhubarb strawberry jam, then I'm ready to move on to, say, apple butter or move on to apricot jam. Or I just like to switch it up. So I don't like to have a huge, a huge jar of one kind of jam we're trying to eat because I like to rotate it out. So I'm going to wash these jars, then I'm going to put them in boiling water to sterilize them. If you're using a boiling water bath to process your jams, which you should be, then your jars need to be sterilized. Some people do that in their dishwasher on the highest setting that is usually marked sanitized. I just like to do it in boiling water. I've got to have a big old kettle of boiling water in order to do the boiling water bath uh, after I get it uh, canned in order to process my jam might as well just go ahead and use that same hot water and sterilize your jars first. So I'm going to do that and I'll get back with you when I've got it on the stove. 
we're back here and I have cooked my rhubarb. It's boiling and it's about where I want it. I have my lids and rings simmering on the back. I have sterilized my jars and I just have them. They're still filled with the hot water because I want to dump the hot water out at the last minute. But I have them sitting in the kettle and it's very hot underneath. The uh, heat's still on that pot so those jars are very hot. Give you a little tip here. I never have enough space in my kitchen when I'm canning. So I just open up my microwave, which is above my stove. That's a good place to sit a hot lid to a pot when I need a place. The other thing is, uh, I have noticed I do a lot of canning. <clears throat> and the steam that comes up from both boiling water bath and pressure canners has allowed moisture to come in here into my um, microwave. And it doesn't hurt it. It just makes it kind of a gray color there, and that's just moisture trapped in there. So I try to open my microwave when I'm canning so that the steam that comes up from the canner doesn't go up in the face of that or the door of the microwave. So that's just a good place to set a lid. The other thing I did, instead of chasing my strawberries around on a plate with one of these potato mashers to try to crush them, uh, you certainly can do that. It just takes you a little longer. I decided to use my immersion blender and I just put it in there and whirled it around. Those strawberries are all mashed up. I'm about to add them to my pot of rhubarb with the appropriate amount of sugar. When it comes to a boil, I'm going to add the pectin. And the pectin is, you can use any brand you want, it's a liquid, a liquid pectin. This one happens to be sure gel or certo liquid pectin. It comes in a, it looks like a little mylar bag, uh, like this. I go ahead and cut the corners off. I think I'm going to need two because I, I don't think one, I have too much fruit for just one, I think. Uh, so I'm ready to go. I do cut the lid off and I stand them up in a glass jar because when my fruit boils, I don't want it to just keep boiling and boiling and boil the flavor and nutrition away. So the minute it boils, I want to be able to grab my sure gel out of the, out, out of my glass and, and put it into my pot. And uh, this is a thick, clear gel, but you don't want to lay it down once you've cut the corner off because it will ooze out. So that's just a little tip, standing up in a glass like that. So I'll come back when I'm ready to fill the jars. Just real quick, I put the funnel that I'm going to use uh, in this hot, hot water in my kettle for just a few minutes. I like everything to be sanitized if I can. Also, any testing spoons I use. Uh oh, I just fogged up. I put in there for a few minutes. I've added my strawberries to the rhubarb. It's about to come to a boil. I have my paper towels ready over here to wipe, wipe the rims of my jar, anything I spill. And I use sterilized water out of the boiling water canner to put on those paper towels as well. All right, my jam is about to reach a boil that cannot be stirred down. I see it just bubbling, which means the boil is soon to come. You can see a little bit of foam on the top. That's the only thing pretty much that you haven't seen me do is to skim the foam. You don't have to chase it all over the pot. Just gather it up on one side and then just skim it off. I have a plate over here where I've been collecting the foam. No need to throw that away. It just make, aesthetically makes a better looking jam if you take the foam off. If you get a little more, you can just, you can just gather it up and just get it off there. Okay, we're almost where we need to be. The only other thing you didn't see me do was I added the appropriate amount of lemon juice to be sure that I had enough acid in there. There's three things that help a jam or jelly to set. One is the amount of pectin in the fruit, and there's very little pectin in strawberries and rhubarb. That's why I'm adding liquid pectin, commercially prepared pectin. But all it is, I mean, it's, a, it's a, an extract from apples. Uh, and you can Google how to make your own pectin if you want to. Here comes that boil. Uh, so it's pectin, acid, and sugar. Those are the three things that make your jams and jelly set. So it's just about to boil here. That's Missy Shooter's term, a boil that can't be stirred down. I like that. That means if you keep stirring, it keeps boiling. It doesn't quit boiling when you stir it. So we're almost there, and then I'm going to be ladling it into my hot jars. I don't think I have quite enough 
of my little jars to fill this, this water bath canner. So I filled two quart jars with hot water just to take up space in that canner so that my jars don't fall over. They serve no real purpose. I'm just except to take up space. Okay, we're almost there. Here's one of the ways I test to see if my jam is ready. And I don't like mine. I don't like my jam really hard. I don't like for it to be hard to spread. I like mine kind of loose. And here is a cool spoon rest, a porcelain spoon rest that sits by my counter. And I put the warm jam in there. I let it sit just a minute. And I just take my finger and divide it. And if it'll stay divided like that for a little bit, then it's holding its shape. And that's good enough for me. Okay, I'm about to put the cans down into the boiling water bath. Just thought I'd show you this. I did not uh, sterilize enough jars, so uh, I'm sure my family's uh, going to be crushed that we're going to have to put this in the refrigerator and just eat it. But here's one of the things I want you to see. Over here by this spoon, you'll see some ripples, ripples forming. That means, just like in candy making, that it's trying to set up. And so I know that I'm going to have a good gel on that. That's just one of the indicators. <coughs> Here's how it looks before going into the canner. Maybe if I set it down there, it looks better. Beautiful uh, burgundy color. This is a jar I have that just, hold on, let me show you the lid here. That some, uh, I bought it for a dollar in the dollar section of my grocery store. Uh, some mandarin orange, oranges came in it, so I know that it had been heat processed. And it has a little rubber gasket on it. So I'm just going to screw the lid down on that and put it in the refrigerator. Those are great. Those are great to keep in your refrigerator to use now. Got a cute little jar for a dollar. Plus I got the mandarin oranges that were in it, which were delicious. Okay, here's the last one. I did take out one of the quart jars of water because I didn't need it. I've got an almost full canner. There we go. And this is something that you have to do with both hands. The rack is sitting up here, so I'm about to lower the cans into the water. I'm going to set my timer for 10 minutes, and then I'll pull them out and show you what they look like. The jars are just out of the canner. They've been in there in a boiling water bath for 10 minutes. Not very long. You may even get the opportunity to hear one ping. I've had a couple ping already. Oh, there's one. Maybe another one. Come on, somebody do it for me. And here are the jars that, the jam that I put in non-sterilized jars because I hadn't sterilized enough. Um, these will, these one, two, three, four will go in the refrigerator. Uh, kind of a great thing to have because you can just walk it over to a neighbor and say, here you go, here's some jam I made for you. You need to put it in the refrigerator. I was canning and didn't sterilize enough jars, but I want you to have this and use it and enjoy it. And that is so fun to do. Anyway, a lot of nice strawberry rhubarb jam. I'll let it sit there for 24 hours, then I'll label it and put it in put it in the boxes. It's very, very hot. I do fill my uh, jam and jelly jars almost to the top. I do not need, need a lot of headroom because they're only in the boiling water bath for about 10 minutes, so they don't expand very much. So you can fill them, you can fill them pretty much up. Don't get rid of your nice hot canning water in it. Mine has a couple of teaspoons of vinegar in it so that my jars won't be cloudy. That's excellent water to clean up your mess with. So use that uh, to make your hot soapy water with. Of course, let it cool down enough to get your hands in it. But don't waste that water. It's excellent to use to clean up, and the vinegar uh, just adds to the cleaning powder. Power. Oh, there's another ping. OK, well, uh, when it cools off just a little bit, what's in the pot, I may let Preparate try it for you and tell you what she thinks.